Welcome back to SAS Connect 101. This is our uh, you know, bi-weekly podcast and webinar talking about all things SaaS partnerships as part of the Cloud Software Association, the network of over 4,000 SaaS partnership leaders. Come join us for free, cloudsoftwareassociation.com. Um, you know, we're talking about something really, I think, important uh, going into the future, you know, heading to the end of this decade. You know, any software company that doesn't think of itself as a platform is going to other, you know, otherwise market itself through someone else's platform. If you don't understand app ecosystems, you know, you're not really, uh, you're really missing the boat of what partnerships are. And there's no one, there's no one who knows more about app ecosystems and app stores than Daniel Sachs, because you've been working on it, uh, you know, back in when I had hair, you know, uh, 12 years now, when we first met, and it ups and downs. So thank you for joining me once again uh, at another one of these. All right, so let's get into it. Um, yeah, first, I think you have news today. Like you didn't have news last week. Something happened. So what's the news? Yeah, the news is that for um, the Cloud Software Association, and this is something we're really excited about, we app direct has, has kind of been a part of this ecosystem for the better part of a decade. Um, but where we started was really enabling enterprises to launch app stores and app ecosystems to showcase third party services. We work with uh, many of the fortune 2000 um, to enable their app platforms, everyone ranging from most of the global telecoms like Rogers, Comcast, AT&T um, to many uh, manufacturers that are looking to build app ecosystems around their devices like ABB, Schneider Electric, uh, Jaguar Land Rover, um, and many larger ISVs like ADP and Coupa and CrowdStrike and MindBody. Um, but uh, recently what we've done is taken uh, all, the, all the kind of activities that it takes to launch a, a commerce-driven app store and condensed it into uh, an addition um, that is really perfect for um, growth startups and SaaS companies in their infancy really thinking about how you can scale from, uh, you know, first listing ecosystem partners all the way through a marketplace that generates over hundred million in, in run rate. Um, so the kind of announcement is um, for this group, and I'll, I'll share the link uh, at the end of this, at the end of the uh, webinar here, um, but we have a sign up flow where you can um, sign up to a commerce edition. Um, the ARR uh, annual fee is, is, is around 20 K. Um, which previously would have cost a lot more. Um, and you can get started um, really quickly uh, building your own app store. Yeah, so for anyone who's trying to build an app ecosystem or an app store, uh, I know, because when you you talked to me a long time ago, we were building our own app store at FreshBooks the hard way <laughs> from scratch. Uh, I guess I never really stopped trying to work on that problem. Uh, so it, it is really difficult and expensive. So 20K is a pretty reasonable price. That's less than a third of the engineering costs that it would take to build it yourself. That's quite a, quite a good deal. Yeah, exactly. What we've found is that, um, you know, the way that people tackle an app store and particularly, you know, in this group, a lot of business development leads um, start by creating, you know, a listing or a content site. Um, and that might take a content management system plus, you know, a few engineers. So right off the bat, you have, you know, investment that's pretty significant. But then as it scales, you want to think about how do you integrate these partners? How do you add more rich capability? How do you integrate things more into your product? And then ultimately, how do you monetize your ecosystem and bill for it and manage for scale? And what we found is that, and, and this is kind of a lot of lessons learned, is at each point, you pretty much have to blow up and rebuild. Um, and that causes a lot of friction in seamlessly scaling your ecosystem. Um, so really what the, the magic of uh, what we're doing today um, is giving you a, a model that you can start, launch, scale, and optimize um, very smoothly so you can scale much uh, much more effectively um, on one platform. You know, it's interesting. Um, I mean, I already gave you a hard time making you hold my baby, so I'm going to give you a hard time now with, with your new baby because there's a I lot of interesting it. problems uh, actually here. And... Um, I'm gonna switch microphones. Can you hear me now? So good. Yeah. Okay. The the like we're assuming that people want to have an app ecosystem, but you know, talking to the members now, like revenue is a big new shift in partnerships rather than product extension, which it used to be like land grabbing, which is what was the old partnership strategy. Now revenue is a big deal, and you know, you're kind of going to convince 
uh, if you want to convince your company to strategically invest in an app ecosystem, uh, what do partner managers say to say we need to do this? Like, what, what, like I'm sure you, I'm sure you've gone through this. You've sold enough of these things. But what, what, what do partner? If I'm a partner manager and go app ecosystem, I should have one of these or an app store. I should have one of these. What are my core talking points? Yeah. So what I think is is super critical is a you need to um, think initial. So what are your initial goals of a partner ecosystem? And to your point, if many partner managers are looking at integration partners and highlighting them, what are the metrics or KPIs that you're going to be measured against? So in that initial phase, um, when you're when you're starting off, um, ideally a partner manager could launch quickly and own your own ecosystem. And um, key metrics at that point are what are the partners that you want to be able to highlight? So this would be like, what's your offline Rolodex right now of partners that um, you want to be able to list and promote online? How do you enable uh, ecosystem around content training enablement um, so your uh, customers can get value from those partners and start adopting? And then the big leap, Sineer, to your point, is moving from a listing of integrated partners to revenue generating commerce. And what we've found for many players trying to do it is if you start as the partner manager with commerce, it really requires alignment across the whole executive team. So you need support from product, from IT, from marketing, from sales, um, and that can, can really take a long time. So with the power of you know, starting with listing your integrated partners um, and leveraging an ecosystem like ours, uh, you can essentially get a lot of a lot longer runway to be able to start generating revenue, to be able to evangelize internally um, versus uh, not having the proof points and having to essentially build a business case um, and kind of a lot of PowerPoint presentations to justify. So what we found really the trick um, is enabling uh, partner managers to have access to um, you know, our platform so they can build their own, you know, demo instance to evangelize internally, start recruiting their own partners, put their partners in, in a lightweight way. And that can be your showcase to be able to evangelize broader. It's interesting. Uh, Cause yeah, this is a chicken and egg problem, right? Cause like you need to show uh, revenue, but you already have like, you have ISVs already in, like on the platform. How, like, how many do you already have that you can oh, just yeah. pull I mean, in? Yes, yeah, so we have, um, thousands of uh, merchants. So those would be like people who sell services on our platform or have a marketplace um, and across all different company sizes, verticals, um, you know, and then we have thousands of uh, providers and ISVs and, um, and tens of thousands of SKUs. Um, so these are example customers that uh, launch our marketplace. Um, but again, you know, many different logos types. And then, you know, these are the types of ISV partners that we sell through our marketplace. Um, so we have catalog of all technology services. Um, we also sell things like telecom subscriptions or energy um, and many ISVs that um, are in this ecosystem. Uh, so uh, what I'd really say when it comes to um, thinking about your own app ecosystem is start small. So you don't need a million apps from day one. You need a few that add really good value um, and building your core value proposition around the ancillary apps is typically the best way to get to market. Um, and you can either leverage our catalog of pre-integrated applications, um, or you can you know, bring in your own services that you want uh, that work well with your product. Yeah, okay. And then like, that's like getting to the CFO's needs, which is where is revenue coming from? So the story is, I mean, first you already have so much inventory, probably some of your partners are already are just like, you just click yes in done and you can get going. Uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure it's true. Like having been in the AppDirect ecosystem, most of the time you're gonna have like probably five, at least five enough, if not 40, 50 potential partners, depending on your vertical already in here. And those are gonna be significant players. Um, but that's a revenue thing. But what, like also there's like, a, there's a strategic element to having an app ecosystem. I mean, aren't like platforms, I mean, this is Jay McBain's uh, new, new stories, ecosystems and platforms of the future. But really it's been the story for, decades, like, uh, I mean, Clay Christensen in Innovator's Dilemma, everyone wants to be a platform. That's just how technology works. And now that all the software's on the internet, it's all networked together. You, if you're the platform, right, then you become like the anchor app, which drives all the market opportunity and therefore 
um, is the advantage. So like the, this is what I, you know, this is how I convinced companies where I work to invest in the ecosystem. Like, don't you want to be the platform? Do you want to be the peripheral? Like how powerful do you want to be? Like if you're a big market, big brand, then, or even a mid-sized brand, then you have the opportunity to organize the platform and become more powerful. Um, you, have, you must have, you must have better sales talking points because you've sold these. Like what, what are the, what are your, 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 your customer, like your, your, your champion, what do they say internally to VP product or the CEO or the board when they, we need to go this direction, this is going to change our company and make us a, like a true market power. Yeah. So there's a lot in there. So I'll unpack it in different, in different parts. Um, the first thing I'd say is that when we looked at our customer cohort, so who's been super successful with launching a marketplace and driving revenue, um, we identified one core similarity um, between all of our clients that are successful versus not. And it actually comes down to an archetype of the individual that's the champion evangelizing within their organization. And we called that the digital hero, someone who has a certain set of characteristics um, that are able to internally evangelize to be able to um, you know, drive success with your ecosystem. And we actually recently are, um, we're going to be uh, publishing the report, but we partnered with Gerald Kane, who's an author of the Technology Fallacy book, as well as um, a, a professor at Boston University. And um, we actually validated the characteristics. So these are having the capability to be able to be visionary, um, have tenacity, um, uh, really drive innovation. Um, and then we also found that there was organizational factors that can enable that digital hero to either succeed and evangelize the vision or to, uh, or that could kind of squash the digital hero and find that they move on to an organization where they can be more powerful. Um, so in that position, you know, all, all of you as partner managers have the potential to be that digital hero or are, and you need um, the right tools to be able to evangelize. Um, and Sunir, I think what you highlighted, and there was a lot of you know, wisdom in your story, um, but the first kind of step as a partner manager is how do you actually say, I'm going to take the vision to digitally transform my, my role. And if my role is building partnerships, I'm going to make sure that that's a digital first experience. So that's where, you know, if you can come on board and quickly build a listing that showcases your partners and have a, a center that anchors the value prop around your right to play, that's super powerful. And, um, you know, I mentioned our commerce edition of 20K. We also have a listing edition for $7.99 a month uh, that's not commerce enabled, which you could get started with right there. Um, to build your listing if you, if you, you know, if you need that. So it's easier today than ever to get started within your role and within your budget to be able to drive momentum. And, you know, what's super key at that point, kind of phase one is saying, look, we live in a digital first world and we want to digitally at first promote our partners. And that's going to drive a bigger ecosystem and more stickiness. Um, so one stat that is really powerful is the Salesforce ecosystem actually generates a six times multiplier um, than Salesforce's revenue. Um, and the power of the Salesforce ecosystem is what's really driving a lot of the market valuation of Salesforce. So having um, stats like this to be able to use, and I'll, I'll send this presentation um, that have you know, a whole bunch of stats, um, but that's super powerful. And also knowing that, look, there are a lot of marketplaces out there of your peers um, that may generate more from their uh, marketplace, um, either in uh, you know add-on capability or in revenue, um, than even their core products. And, and many of um, you know the, this group here it could be generating upwards of 100 million in gross merchandise value, which is really the transaction volume uh, on on your store. So there's a lot of a lot of money there. But I think the first step um, is really identifying you know as a partner manager. You're going to be your role, primary role is to evangelize and to be this transformation agent. Start by doing that for yourself and your role. From there, you can showcase look, we have these partners already. How do we capture more of that revenue? So when I gave you, I'm going to give you a hard time in a second. I'm just like building up, building it up because I, I, I was even giving you guys a hard time about App Direct Engage, which is a great conference, but you've changed the words over time because you're definitely going more enterprisey, uh, okay. digital, digital experience platform and chief digital officer. Yeah. Uh, and uh, which makes sense for large companies, you know, especially you have a lot of like you know, mainstream companies, like blue chip companies now as customers. And I'm laughing because, you know, I would say it in a much more direct way, like right on the nose, like punch him right on the chin. It's like, hey, don't you want to own your brand? <laughs> it's like, 
Like, isn't it, isn't it amazing what you've done, CEO? Like, look how great our company is. All our customers love us, right? And what do you want the, your partners to look like? This is, I, you know, I get really, but when you explain this, yeah, I know exactly what you're going to, but this is how I say it. Like, why would you put all your integrations in your help center documents? Like they're lost everywhere. That's not a feature, right? That's just, uh, you know, that's not something you, a feature something you like put on a spotlight on your marketing materials. Like, yes, we have this, we're amazing, right? Uh, a function is just something you put in your help center document is here, click here, you solve this problem. But your integration ink ecosystem is when your customers come to your site is like, are there any good? And then you have like this huge amount of ecosystem around you. Like, look, everyone builds on us because we're amazing, right? Uh, and that actually gets customers excited because they know when that's, they buy it into your that's platform. That's great. I mean, yeah. if you look at like even us, we use hundreds of different SaaS tools internally and we're evaluating partners. One of the key is, you know, they integrate with other stacks. So if you can prominently and proudly show your integrations, um, then it just adds so much more weight to your value proposition. And, you know, yeah, senior, I think like there's nothing better than saying, look, prominently be proud of your brand and showcase your brand and showcase the great partners that are associated with your brand or making your brand better. Um, but if you can succeed at doing that, um, which I think is the first step, right, is, is how, do you, how do you win over um, being a brand that's associated with other good brands? Um, then I think what, what becomes easier is to quantify the business case. Yeah. And as I mentioned with Salesforce's ecosystem generating six times more than their revenue, um, if you essentially have a partner ecosystem with listed integrations and you know your customers are buying all these other tools and services, you have the ability to capture some of that and be the trusted provider to capture that revenue. And that's actually much easier to quantify once you have uh, an ecosystem of these products you know how many times people are clicking into them, you know how much you're referring it becomes way easier to quantify the business case. Yeah, another, like there's like, uh, so in Salesforce, I didn't realize up to six. Yeah, so they're like, they like Microsoft's at uh, over $9 now. I mean, they're the, obviously the absolute masters of this ecosystem. You know, they're 1.3% of the world's economy, Microsoft, like one, one of 80 people's lives on this planet depend on Microsoft. What's, what's super Microsoft. interesting about Microsoft, and I remember there was always a debate um, when we were starting with is like, is, uh, Google Apps better, or Microsoft 365. And what was interesting is that Microsoft 365, like originally was so hard to buy. Google was so easy to adopt. And um, we thought that like Microsoft was old school and Google is going to you know eat their lunch. But when they turned on their channel, which they've always been able to work with, right? They leveraged their partners. All of a sudden they were able to skyrocket. And we saw those numbers, you know, transition in a period of a couple of years. Um, and that shows the power of partnerships and, and, and embracing channel. And to your point, Microsoft's been exceptional at channel. Um, and that nine times multiplier is a great example how you know traditional software companies who didn't even have a head start with SaaS um, were able to grow because of the power of their channel and their partnerships. Yeah, I, I would love to go down this a bit of a rap hole, but like one, one analogy, which is true, that I'd like people to wrap their heads around about Google versus Microsoft. It's the same thing as Pepsi versus Coca-Cola. You know, Coca-Cola can put a bottle of sugar water anywhere on this planet, it feels like. You know, it has such a good logistics chain. Uh, in Africa, there's a program where they're using it for vaccine distribution, Coca-Cola, because they just literally can put anything anywhere on this planet if they feel like it. Pepsi cannot. It was basically restrained almost entirely. I mean, now it's grown, but it's mostly United States only. Uh, it has a much more constrained market. And that's very similar to Google versus Microsoft. Google might have had the like the SaaS cloud, born in the cloud first universe, but, but because they never had distribution like Microsoft does, uh, you know, obviously Microsoft is now like either the number one or number two in every category they're in. They're the number one B2B SaaS company by a, like a, a country mile uh, because of this. And that's the power of actually being closer to the customer, which is getting back to like bringing it back around to here. Like if you're closer to the customer, customers trust you, right? Customers follow the data. It's basically how it is. Like when you're going to buy, you're going to buy an Aphromap app because it's not because you're listed there because it's integrated with your software or something. It's like, or it's part of your experience. It's part of your whole product solution using crossing the chasm terms. And they already bought from you. They're going to buy the rest of the stuff. They're going to complete the solution from you because you're the thing that they're buying from, right? Everything else is OEM, like an extra component, a peripheral, a mouse and a keyboard to your computer effectively, right? And that's the opportunity for you. You're closer to the customer and there's revenue for sure. And partnerships shouldn't be a charity anymore. You're not just being nice to your partners. You want to make some money being in front of it so you can cover and grow your partnership function. But also from a sales point of view, your customers can't buy your software without everything else. And so 
to make the solution. So, you know, if you really want to get into these bigger, st bigger, stickier sales, you need a solutions based sales process. And this is where ecosystems come into. Exactly. This, this, is, me, power... this is me telling your, your, your digital experience platform story. I know. I, I love it. I mean, Sunir, um, Sunir is the best evangelist, but I think you've seen that. And, and so has the, the Cloud Software Association group, right? In that yeah. you have the potential to sell through partners, but you also have the potential for partners to sell through you. And that becomes actually very hard to manage because you have so many different partner points. Um, but if you can digitize that and monetize that, uh, the opportunity is limitless and it positions you in a brand that people love you. Um, and you know, maybe that's a good segue. I know Sunir was dying for me to share like what what makes this so hard and, and what are the pitfalls? Oh, you, you've had more of a journey than anyone. And by the way, this is a point. I mean, if you have questions now, if you're listening to this or you're going, I'm thinking about doing this, like far away, because like, you know, Daniel and I, uh, you know, we're doing this conversation. Put your questions in the chat or in the Q&A, it's even better. And we'll get to them because this is really your time, uh, folks. But yeah, like you, you see, like you went through it at the beginning. It wasn't as easy as you thought. So, and you know, all, and you've, but now you've succeeded. So what are all the things that you've learned? I mean, I think no one knows better than you. It's like you specifically, what was wrong here? Uh, but you've been teasing us with this slide for like 20 minutes. Let's, let's, get to, <laughs> what, are, what are the answers? There we go. What there are there the go. Calls? You know, again, I think that the, from our perspective, the biggest characteristic or driver of success is you, right? It's the person who's going to evangelize the ecosystem. But in order to win, you have to overcome a, a, a lot of challenges and pitfalls. Um, I'll tell you a story. Our first marketplace launch. So we had, um, you know, Ray, kind of pitched the business on a slide deck to our first customer, who was a big enterprise. Um, we then got an LOI. We then raised seed round, hired 10 people. And this was in a period of like two years. And all of our development efforts were, was for this one launch. And think of this as being like a, you know, one of the biggest, let's say telecoms in, in, a, in a region. And we put a ton of effort into this first launch, you know, spent, uh, you know, tons of time in development. And this is right around the time the Facebook movie came out where you'd see the uh, user numbers count. Like, so it's like, oh, we met, we have a million or we have 2 million. So I remember the execs on the marketing team were like, we're going to have billboards. We're going to have airplane signs. We're going to have mailers. We're going to have so much traffic that your site's going to break and your servers are going to go down. Like, be ready. So we spent um, the better part of uh, you know, a year building for this and integrating apps and trying to recruit applications. Um, some of the earlier ones were, you know, members of this group. Um, and at launch, uh, we had this big moment. We pressed the red button. Um, we kind of uh, like, you know, watched the user count and it was like crickets. And then um, the next day we, you know, we all pass out because we've been staying up for 72 hours trying to get all the developers integrated and still nothing. A month later, nothing. And one of the partners I was trying to um, recruit at the time was Shopify and Harley, um, who is their president, but was their, their, their partnerships person, um, sent me a note that their interns blog has more traffic than this app store. Um, and, and, and just like, like Harley. Yeah, it sounds like Harley. Exactly. Yeah. But, yeah. That sounds like something he would say. Yeah. But so, so we had to start and kind of like go back to first principles. Like it, why isn't this working? And ultimately what we found is that um, an app store with your logo, with no differentiation or integration to your core value proposition um, is not, you know, is frankly, and you know, this could be an insult to our own business, but it's just useless. So, uh, you know, our technology without you um, uh, cannot be possible. And that's the power of our ecosystem is partnering um, to make, you know, the, 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 your vision a reality. Um, but what we learned very quickly is that you need to um, use digital strategies um, and build a value proposition around your customers. So I think that because, um, because you know your customers best, you really have to think about what exactly is the value that my customer is gonna get from this app store. And one of the kind of most interesting insights that we had from working with a lot of enterprises is they always think like top-down marketing. So what's the billboard? What's the commercial? How do we drive you know, millions of users? But what we found is the players that focused on segmentation um, would do the best. So instead of building a business case saying we're going to make you know million dollars the first year and ten million in the second year, um, start small. Say our goal, you know, in the in the first launch from a monetization perspective is to get ten pilot users, and you know maybe that's going to give a run rate of ten to a hundred thousand dollars in year one. Um, but then that compounds. 
So it's funny because if we cohort our early uh, failed marketplaces and our early successful marketplaces, then now some of them could have a run rate of 10, 20, 100 million in, in ARR. The key difference is that in the early days, one business case was predicated on a very specific value proposition with their app as an anchor app with services around it um, and generated a little bit, but had an exponential growth curve and was able to grow seamlessly. The ones that failed were the ones that had a very ambitious business case with no sense of the value prop to the end user um, and essentially missed their metrics in the early days, didn't have the momentum to keep investing in the project and it got shut down. Now, you know, I don't want to, I don't, I mean, obviously in Canada, I know the companies you speak of, uh, and I'm sure we can pull the old press releases and it's not that public, but you have, you, you, you have like, you have, I mean, you're Canadian, so you have the big telcos here, like in Canada. And so you do have actually kind of a really good ABLE split test or a BR split test, so to speak, uh, in Canada, if you know Canada. So, uh, so you've seen this, like, so the first one was uh, just like, advertising only, no idea what these things were. I mean, this is the early days of the cloud. Like cloud was good or whatever we were calling it back then. But the second one, which was harder to win, is now successful. I mean, you put the logo up at the beginning. I guess I can mention Rogers, right? So they, they, uh, they're they successful. So what did they, what was the value prop? They, I mean, it's not what all our members are, but they found a value prop. So what, what, what was it for them? Curious. Yeah, I'd say that for any successful partner, um, or, or kind of person launching a marketplace, the success comes down to what's the value proposition to your customer. So for example, in the telecom world, telcos have right to play in communications and security. So, you know, can you offer, uh, you know, Zoom or WebEx, or can you offer Microsoft 365, or can you offer hosting, or can you offer backup, or can you offer security? But how do you bundle that to make it easy for a small business uh, to be able to adopt? That was the key is kind of really looking at um, what's that initial value prop and staying really tight to that message versus having you know, a listing of thousands of apps that really don't are connected. And then in product experiences, and this for SaaS companies is most important. So Senior, you mentioned that you know, many people in this group have integrations that are SaaS to SaaS you know, through APIs. That's the best you know, part to be able to highlight, showcase, and then ultimately monetize because they're providing value to your customers already. So if you um, already are working in you know, the open API world and you have uh, integration partners, chances are like, look at the data around what integration partners are working best with you. Um, those are probably the ones that you wanna highlight, build the value prop around um, and, and then really streamline to be able to sell. So it's- So like in, in this case, in telco, if I remember correctly, it's been a little while since I've been in this sales cycle with you, but like the, the, what they did, like, so these telcos, they have, resellers, like real, real sellers, like, cause they're actually doing physical handsets. They're going out into the SMBs of the world or whatever. They're like putting, giving them all like their cell phones or building call centers out for the sales team. They have dispatch for like, you know, field service. They're doing all that stuff. But because now everything is now smart devices and data and clouds and whatever, not, you can't just put phones in. You have to put phones, you got to put Dropbox in, you got whatever it is, you know, you got to put in Office 365, you got to put in like backup security in order to build out a complete, uh, SMB communications system. It's a whole solution back to crossing the chasm, you know, the customer wanted. That's the value. And they couldn't, like these sales reps could do that sale and they understood all those things, but they didn't have a means to make the sales motion for these other components of the whole system until uh, your AppDirect ecosystem, like for the app stores came in. And then it, then it worked, right? You know, that was basically what happened. It's like they were able to say, yeah, we can take over the whole whole problem, the whole problem for the customer, which is what an SMB would want. So just take care of this for me. Exactly. Right? So I, I would say that the, the constant thread uh, for any of our successful partners are what's the solution you're offering? Um, so, you know, think of yourself as, you know, one product, what's, what are you building your ecosystem around? And in the, you know, communications world, right, it could be saying, here's your teleconferencing bundle uh, for, uh, you know, uh, a group of people across different regions. And it comes with a polycom, a video, you know, uh, uh, you know, webcam, Zoom, you know, some other capabilities. So I think you you know best as the partner manager what services work best with your product. Um, and I'd say like maniacally focus on um, adding value through that solution um, and being able to package it and integrate it uh, so it's seamless uh, for your customer cohort. 
it doesn't have to always be channel sales. In that case, it's a channel sale, but there are, I believe you have another one where it was like a plugins ecosystem. Like when you have a whole, when you have the whole solution built together with third parties, you need some way, way to put it all together for the customer. So they go, yep, 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 yep. Right? Yeah, like one example, um, you know, you, you mentioned this one earlier, but it's the ADP marketplace. Um, and, you know, this is thinking about, okay, they were uh, known in the US as like the number one payroll provider offline. Um, and they wanted to go through a digital transformation to be known as the best digital first human capital management and, and solution. Um, and they realized, look, there are uh, services that can integrate well to our, to our offering. Um, but because we know the persona of the payroll lead or HR manager, um, we can start recommending um, other categories and applications. Um, so, you know, thinking about like what, what's their right to play. If you look here, they don't have, you know, accounting and uh, Microsoft 365 is their core. They have areas that are really relevant to them, like learning management um, or benefits administration. Um, and then they have a rich ecosystem now of uh, hundreds of, of applications. Um, and what many of our partners do is have intelligent recommendations. So as you gain more scale and you know profiling on your customer, um, when each customer logs in, um, you can recommend intelligent applications uh, and, and services you know, in that category. Um, and then what we've also found is that right now, I'm just on the website, but if you're a customer in their product in a logged in state, um, you can already be unified to a single bill and um, identity. So you can essentially just buy and get pushed to you know, your unified bill. So these are examples of how um, ecosystems can evolve to, to be really rich. Uh, but the key success factor is having the categories around your right to play. Around the sorry, categories around the? Your right to play. So where do your customers see your right to play um, and not yeah, yeah. stepping above those bounds? Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, it's basically, I always think, you know, what I've learned over the last year and a half where we've been really focusing on metrics uh, inside the CSA is when you mentioned top down, every SaaS company, software company, I think it's actually probably beyond SaaS. It probably was how it was decades ago, but they they think inside the walls of the software company from the from the product into the market, which is the tail wagging the dog, the customer is driving everything. And if you don't have a customer centric view of partnerships and sales, you're gonna have a hard time. But in this case, the customer says, I want more things from the people I trust. And they, by the way, you know, they trust you. I mean, that's the whole thing. You built a great brand. You know, they, they trust you for SaaS recommendations. You're the SaaS company they trust. Of course you can build more solutions. Um, you know, so what, where can you, fill it out. It doesn't always have to be with you type, typing code in, right? You can always bring in third parties to build a more richer solution. And then of course you get to your customers. Yeah. Um, and one, one recent trend though, that I'd say is like around the headless ecosystem. So um, when we started a lot of our, you know, go to market would be either our professional services teams building out something custom or, um, you know, having an, an SI or the IT teams building a really complex marketplace, right? And spending a lot of time on optimizing for the marketplace. Um, but what we've seen uh, now is a lot of partners can use our um, APIs and kind of build headless experiences um, or can build our storefront builder um, where you can you know, change the colors, the logo, the ecosystem and um, really get up to speed without technical resources. Um, so I think that when, you know, if you go back to near the examples we're talking about years ago, it took you know, years and millions of dollars that's come down to you know, under 20K um, or you know, for license plus a few resources on your side um, and just the imagination. You know, in a matter of weeks, you can get a demo experience up. So I think that the path to generating value and revenue is so, so much faster. Um, and what we've seen is our most successful uh, partners are ones that are now thinking dev first. So just like with them, um, you know, Stripe, they have a, a, you know, an API that people build on top of and, and really have customized the checkout flow, um, you know, or with Shopify for physical goods, being able to really leverage um, their uh, ecosystem um, after bringing that for technology providers to be able to um, get started and start uh, really differentiating. Yeah, I mean, I don't want to step on your shadow here, but like, this is the thing that I thought was the biggest risk was trying to get rid of like, get the developers and product and support and finance on board by getting the billing integration out of this story and just do a payments integration. That's what we're working on at Bind. Like, what are you doing? Uh, I'm really interested in this because this is one of the biggest objections, but now you've been successful at bringing on third parties, the ISVs into the ecosystem. They, they look at it and go, oh, that's a big wall to climb. 
right? But AppDirect is, you know, obviously done a lot now. You have thousands, right? So how do you how do you convince internal engineering first that this is not going to be disgusting, and then your th- your partners to go, yeah, we can do this. This is going to yeah. be valuable. So as you scale um, at monetizing third party services, and if you have your own channel, so if you have multiple tiers of sellers and resellers, um, because it's not only about being digital first, it's also about being omni-channel. Um, the billing complexity can be very complicated. And, you know, AppDirect made that easier by having, you know, a subscription billing engine built for omni-channel third party. Um, but selling that initially and trying to think of how you map that to your existing billing system um, has been, you know, a, a challenge for, particularly if, you know, a partner manager like yourself is trying to get started. Um, so I think, you know, Sineer with AppBind, like that's a great uh, solution to look out for. Um, other ways to get started without requiring, you know, billing integrations um, are leveraging, you know, some of our payments uh, solutions. Uh, but really, you know, thinking about a way to um, start, build momentum, and then eventually, you know, you can work out um, billing integrations, product integrations, yeah, um, but I think help path. You start off with you have the directory version, like where it's just yep. a listing. Because then you want the main thing is to put it in front of the customers, not get your like get get the story in front of the customers, get action, right, and then improve it uh, over time. So like you've done this. I, I, did you have? I think you also. I mean, I may be wrong, but you also have like a manual provision flow. Like customer, I want this, and they send like a lead to the. Oh partner. yeah. So one of the yeah the big fallacy I think that we had in the early days is we were maniacal about everything being fully API driven. So our vision was okay. You're an end business, so let's say I'm a furniture store and I want to buy from. Um, you know, the ERP that runs, it's called Profit Systems that runs the furniture store industry and, and they have, you know, 20 partners. Um, I need all those partners to be fully integrated for provisioning user management, feeds, streams, billing. Um, and for me to start, I need to go convince them to spend, you know, weeks or months of engineering effort to do a full integration. Um, and I think, you know, that can all be done and it adds good value as you scale. But at the beginning, the power of you know a referral uh, with a swivel chair, um, you know, just to start off, um, is a much more lightweight way for you to you know entice your um, your partners, and it also uh, reduces the level of effort the partner manager, the BD person, needs to do on the other side uh, to justify an integration. So I think that um, you know in your role, you have to do a lot of convincing you know with your partners and with your internal teams to build um, and do dev work. And what we've really tried to do, and I think it's similar to what Sineer is kind of doing with, with AppBind, which is awesome, all these things are great, um, is to really try to uh, remove the complexity of having to internally and externally sell so many players to give investment to get your first customer and to get started. So if you can inverse that, where if you can leverage AppBind or AppDirect um, or both um, and get started, yeah, you're gonna buy our company one day. Just let's get over with. That's fine. That, I think yeah, that's Run. why the names are architected uh, within our. They're already our, set up. You just you don't even have to rename you. Yeah. So okay. this is the kind of stuff that drives people absolutely batty because it's actually both sides of the table. Everyone who touches this thing, and this is what I want to get. I want to. I want to stop and, and and dive down one more time on what we just said because what AfterX power is is that. Okay, so let's let's because some people are just listening. So you need billing. This is the thing that kills you, right? In app stores, it's so difficult. It's not just the engineering too, like finance, support, uh, product. You know, everyone sales are going to be like wrapped up with all these processes because these are core to a SaaS company. But this is why you can't build all this. Like, you just no way. Even if you tried, you'd be able to do it at the level that you can purchase it now. You should just, I mean, for like twenty k. I mean, that's you're going to spend 250k of engineering to do this but billing is like rip apart your whole billing system add a third-party billing and then you have to like can the worms of all the complexity of other people's billing that's the one that really is the most painful life cycle management means people like get fired or hired or leave and you got to manage like license management uh, contracts uh you know integrating it's like ssos you know all that stuff uh and then you got to do the marketing here, revised go-to-market approach. So the marketing and co-sale, co-marketing, if your partner's a revenue attribution, which is a big deal in partner land right now. It's like, how do you even know this partner? Came, like this lead came from a partner. Uh, you know, And then of course, support, uh, customer support. And that's just your problem. And then you haven't got to the customer experience, which is your last point here. So the customer has to feel good about this whole experience, which I know you guys have spent a lot of time on design. And like, this is what you're buying 
when you're, like you're buying off the shelf from AppDirect, but you know, this is internally for you launching an app store, but then for your partners, they look at this wall. It's like, oh, that's a lot of to-dos, but you've actually simplified. There's like, there's a, there's a crawl walk run now in AppDirect for each of these, right? So a partner looking at this, like, yeah, they can go really deep and like build it all out, but now, you, but, or you can just what, what, give you a logo and a blurb, right? And then an email address or something, right? And that's they're, exactly they're ready right. to go. So we, yep. we've really taken a lot of time to understand all the friction points and really productize that um, and enable it either in a you know headless way with API documentation that you can build on top of, um, or in a configuration way where you can you know upload the logo, change the colors, make it easy for you, but also make it easy for your partners. Yeah, and and like if you want to like convince internally, this is what we I had to go through you know, at FreshBooks uh, when we we're doing the App Store. Like I remember this because I had to spec it out with every single team, and I just realized the mountain that I had. You know, bidding off, and we spent four hundred grand uh, in today's money on our venture before we even killed it because it was just like a fool's errand because we had to maintain it all, right? But like this is like you weren't even like you were just a baby at this time, you know, so we couldn't even buy it. But, like if you like now that you know there's, there's someone who's not only figured it out once but across multiple ecosystems, that's a pretty compelling value prop not to sell more AppDirect like I'm trying to, but like it is actually true. Like there's no way anyone can reproduce this anymore. Like, you guys are 12 years in to this. This is like really significantly difficult. Yeah, I definitely think like the ways that we can collaborate, right, are to enable you to build your own app store. And um, and then the other is obviously to enable you to sell on other app stores. And what's powerful is that it's kind of the same investment integration. So if you're working with us um, and you build your app store and you're integrating your product for that, then you can also have access to be syndicated to our network of thousands of app stores and advisors. So one, you had MindBody and Coupa, you're powering those. If people want to check out AppDirect in, 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 in live, you go to the MindBody store, or ADP's marketplace. So that's another good one you mentioned. Coupa. Yeah, check out these, uh, you know, the different types of marketplaces. Um, and, but even better than that, um, this link here, um, and I can also, um, Let's see, copy it into the chat. Um, allows anyone in the cloud so uh, software association um, to uh, really kind of get started, um, and we can help set up a, a store on your behalf. Um, or you can go to our sign up flow on our website and um, and get a free trial. Um, but really, what we're you know offering to to this group is, hey, look, we'll take the time to um, give you a, a, a cons consultation on how you can get up to speed. We kind of handled you through that initial um, development. And help answer some of those friction questions around, you know, should I just use this out of the box and change the colors myself, um, or do I want to, you know, have, uh, uh, you know, build on your APIs? Um, so we're really trying to make it as easy for you um, to get success as quickly as possible. Okay, so Ed Chan asked this question: uh, Do you have any examples? I think it's a good question of high quality value props when pitching companies to join your ecosystem and develop an app. Because I mean, it is true; it's a significant capital investment upfront and ongoing to look at this opportunity, you're going to have to do some convincing persuasion, but it, you know, it could work out. So how, what, what do you recommend? Uh, yeah, I think, okay. So the first thing is I definitely think that the more tailored it is to your use case, the better, um, because there is going to be a, um, typically like any, you know, SaaS company has a limited amount of engineering that they can do. Um, so making it easier is essentially starting first by a referral, like, like Senior said, or showcasing with data, like, hey, here's how, um, how many customers would be interested in your app. Um, so for example, if I were to just kind of rehash that value prop, if you're um, a legal uh, you know, SaaS company um, and you're really working across the legal profession and you're trying to bring in someone who's doing uh, secure contract lifecycle management, right? Um, you could first start by creating a promotion that you send to your customers um, and then going to the different uh, contract lifecycle management companies and saying, look, there's interest from, you know, a thousand of my customers to generate, you know, to essentially find a good partner. If you do this integration, um, you know, we'll be able to uh, unlock th this new channel for you. Um, so I think a lot of it is how do you quantify um, the first cohort? to be able to drive immediate value. And what we found, and this gives the same example I gave from the successful stores from the unsuccessful ones, is start small and build versus starting tops down um, and setting, you know, uh, setting expectations too hard to fail. So instead of saying like, oh, we have, you know, a, a market for 30 million lawyers, let's partner so you can get access to our, you know, every lawyer in the market. 
a better way would be to say, I have actually these, you know, five companies that are willing to actually pilot this integration and they're willing to spend, you know, hundred dollars a month on your service. And if we can actually make this work, we can then scale it to our 20,000 customers um, and really figure out what the value point of that integration is. That's the key. So um, I would definitely recommend leverage data is kind of number one, show that you know the customer that's going to add value um, and start small. Yeah, we have this, like we have this phrase, uh, customers follow their, the data, as in the, follow the functional flow through your app. So when they were going through your app and then they need, they need another app to complete what they're doing. Those are the apps that will sell because they need another piece of software to, to finish the work that they're trying to do. Those are the ones that do well. When you, like you said, you just like, I have a big app store. Everyone who pays attention to me pays attention to all this other stuff. The customers are going to be confused because they don't think about you as a place to retail software. They're thinking about you to solve a problem, a job to be done. And the integrations that do well, they're ones that allow that job to be done if you miss something. So exactly. Yeah. And we also think like you're if you're just launching an app store, like you know, my app dot uh, app store dot com, and that's that's your goal, that's a very limited uh, um result. I think of it as like you're launching a digital ecosystem and your app store is maybe one place that, that can be a landing page, but you can generate uh, momentum through in product flow signups, through um, you know your dev docs, through your marketing materials, through your uh, landing pages. So through sales teams, through your channel partners. Um, so I definitely think that uh, you know launching just a website is not the end goal. It's really um, how do you drive value from your partner ecosystem? And if you think creatively about that, there's a lot of different ways um, to be able to market and generate demand. Um, and that the digital app store is one, and we're you know we're definitely um, incentive to you know uh, promote it. But I think that the the most successful partners we've seen are ones that see this as truly a platform to enable their ecosystem and think of creative ways to promote um, and drive traffic. Yeah, a big bucket, right? I mean, it's just a brochure until you put it into the middle of your customer's life, you know? Exactly. You know, embedded you sales experiences is one of the ways to look at it. So in the, you know, how can you embed opportunities at the point of value for that customer? Um, so again, giving the legal example, you know, if, if there's, if you have a basic, you know, contract management flow uh, in your product uh, or a tab that talks about it, you know, add a call to action there that says, you know, have you upgraded to one of our partner applications? Here's the link, and after I can give you the, the way to make that easier. But like, you know, you could click a buy button because you're already logged into your product, and instantly, you know, trial or buy that service in in a kind of at point of need. That's an example of like a really value add, uh, easy experience. All right. I don't want to let you go before we uh, without going to you have put this really good slide around KPIs for other departments. That uh, is like the thing that people ask about all the time. Yeah, so the two things that I would definitely recommend you check out and we'll send this through is our readiness checklist, which really helps you think through what are the questions you need to ask yourself, uh, you know, in, in kind of getting on this journey. Um, and then the other is really thinking about the KPIs for your success. And I think we've talked about them in different ways, but step one is what are your adoption KPIs? So how do you really know your customer value proposition and how do you measure that based on, you know, the value prop to your customer stickiness um, and your customer growth rate? The next is really retention and engagement metrics. This is like, how do you actually start to see the conversion um, of people who are engaging with your store or your different um, storefronts? So this is like active users to the profile page, number of products per user in terms of signups, single sign-on logins is a huge one, um, or API integration calls. So you can really get a sense of like, where's the traffic coming from? Um, and then there's the, the revenue and profit metrics. Um, our core KPI across our whole business is gross merchandise value. So we succeed if our partners succeed at driving um, transaction volume. Um, and it's definitely one that I'd say is the kind of core metric that everyone's looking at. Um, but then you can look at you know, margin metrics and uh, revenue contribution to core. So a lot of our customers have done really sophisticated churn analysis studies. And what they found is that these ecosystems not only help generate incremental revenue, but even more so help um, create more stickiness because uh, you know, when a customer is buying multiple things from you, it, they see much more value and it's way harder for them to leave. 
I think this is really important. I know everyone's pushing to revenue right now, but the adoption, retention, engagement metrics are still the core reason integrations work. Is that your product is not a is not an isolated like magical you know wand. You know it, it has to work with the whole system. And what the great thing about having an app ecosystem, you can actually see the whole system being sold to the customer. So you know that you know you're being embedded in what, and that it, the whole thing's being sold, and you can have a grip on it. And that's part of your product. Is not just what your your devs are writing, but all the other things around you is your whole solution. Exactly. Uh, and then, to steal one of Sanir's comments, right? Like you have trust of your customer. <laughs> you know, you can't start selling them something before you have a value prop. So if you really know your customer, you're going to be thinking around what are the adoption metrics, what are the retention metrics, and then you have the trust. You've earned it. Then it's it's much easier to generate the revenue. But if you build an app store with no value prop or understanding of your customer. Um, that's where the, the marketplaces have a harder, harder chance of succeeding. But the, 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 the kind of money um, slide uh, or really kind of talk track is that we have more partners than ever that are succeeding. And if I do go back to what was the biggest barrier for a successful ecosystem, it was actually the ability to start small and grow. So we're really confident with the technology we have and the lessons learned and the ecosystem here of many uh, people who have been through it um, you can start small, gain very fast value and momentum, um, and ultimately scale seamlessly toward a really big revenue target. Yeah, well, this little surprise announcement, I think really fits to that, that mantra you guys have been working on for 10 years is uh, taking this big beast of an app ecosystem, app store and like slowly figuring out how do we make this simpler, easier, lower cost, get something going, focus on the customer transaction, just get something up and running. Now that you look... I don't know what your enterprise costs are. I have some idea, but this is like a like a I don't know, let's say ten, a tenth of the cost. It's like a real level. It's a huge difference. Uh, so you know, I know I'm on behalf of the members. I guess thank you because it's a lot of it's a big opportunity for 2022. You know, as everyone's trying to get into the ecosystem game, as they should uh, to yes. have this. And, and yeah, yeah, while you're all going through that journey, um, myself and, and the team here really happy to work uh, you know through it and and. You know, I always like to provide and offer support, you know, not just if you're going to use us, but at any point in the journey, because we know that oftentimes, um, you know, the first, the hardest hump is actually you uh, understanding the vision, what it can be, demoing that and evangelizing it. So um, if there's any tools, data, stats, or, or kind of product support you need to enable that, we're happy to be there for you. Yeah, I should also mention Rory, who's on the board, Rory Gallagher. He's in exactly. the CSA Slack, the Cloud Software Association Slack, which is free to join. If you're just if you're still listening, uh, go to cloudsoftwareassociation.com, join free. You should buy drinks for everyone once in a while, although now there's 3,000 of us that might get pricey. Uh, thank you so much for doing this. I really appreciate this. Uh, thank you, Senior. I mean, you've been such a great evangelist of this ecosystem, and uh, you know this whole group wouldn't be there without you. So, yeah, I did give you a hard time a little bit, as, as is tradition. So As is tradition, yeah. All right. Bye, everyone. See you in Slack. Bye, everyone. Thanks. Thanks.